no better place to give a speech about the rule of law than Keith Mohill Academy, particularly because in the presence of students from the law school and all their faculties. In the 20 years since its rebirth in an independent Ukraine, this university has built its national and international reputation on the premise that integrity, intellectual honesty, and academic freedom is the only bedrock on which a quality university can be founded. Before I begin my speech, I would like to mention that this year is the 20th anniversary of the Fulbright program in Ukraine. And to acknowledge a very special guest who is in our audience today, the Vice Chairman of the Fulbright Board, Susan Ness. She is help, here to help us mark this anniversary. She joins us at Keith Mohila in recognition that this university has been a home base for so many Fulbright scholars and students over the last, over the years, including both the current president, Sergei Keith, and the honorary president, Mr. Brufetsky. We are very proud of this connection, and I know the Fulbright organization is equally proud. Aristotle wrote something 2,300 years ago that I think remains pretty relevant today. He said, and here I'm quoting, at his best man is the noblest of animals. Separated from law and justice, he is the worst. There's no society, at least none that is truly civilized, where that rule does not apply. In recent years, throughout the world, individuals are standing up and demanding to live in democratic societies governed by genuine laws, with no person above the law and all leaders held accountable. The health of a democratic society largely corresponds to the degree to which it is ruled by its own laws. So today I'm going to focus on four key areas. First, that the rule of law is a prerequisite for democracy. Second, that without a reliable justice system, economic development opportunities in a globalized world will be severely limited. Third, that today Ukraine stands poised to adopt meaningful formal reform if it chooses to do so. And fourth and finally, what does this all mean to you as students here at Kiev Mohila? Well, you may ask yourself as I start, what do I mean by the rule of law? Well, we went to the Google, like everybody, and we found that the, a 2004 report of the UN Secretary General has a definition. And like most UN definitions, it's not one sentence, it's many sentences. <laughs> but it actually covers a lot of key points. So listen carefully to the definition. Move this microphone up a little bit here. For the United Nations, the rule of law refers to a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. It requires as well measures to ensure adherence to the principles of the supremacy of law, equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the application of the law, separation of powers, participation in decision making, legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrariness, and procedural and legal transparency. That's a pretty good definition. It covers just about every single piece. These principles lie at the heart of many of the issues that frankly occupy my time here as American ambassador in Ukraine. I strongly believe personally, just as my government does, that the rule of law is fundamental to the success of any modern democratic nation. 
All people in a society must know that they have access to public justice when they have been harmed and that, when they, that they will receive transparent and fair treatment if suspected of crimes. Businesses must know that contracts are sacred and that they will be enforced. A core part of the United States Embassy's work here is to help the Ukrainian people achieve their goal, becoming a prosperous, democratic, independent state that is integrated into European institutions. This is frankly impossible without the rule of law. In a 1998 article in Foreign Affairs magazine, Tom Carruthers of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace warned that the rule of law should not be viewed as a, quote, panacea for the ills of countries in transition from dictatorships or statist economies. He warned that writing constitutions, laws, and regulations is the easy part. Far-reaching institutional reform is arduous and slow. Well, I have to tell you, that first part, I'm not so that sure that it's as easy as he says it is, but I know the second part is, in fact, even harder. Carruthers continues, Western nations and private donors have poured hundreds of millions of dollars into rule of law reform, both, but outside aid is no substitute for the will to reform, which must come from within. He describes three levels or types of reform. First, reforming laws and regulations. Second, strengthening law-related institutions and increasing their competence, efficiency, and accountability. And three, the deeper goal of increasing government compliance with the law and achieving genuine judicial independence. Well, we have various U.S. government programs here in Ukraine which assist in trying to help Ukraine achieve the first two types, where the government moves toward the ultimate implementation of the third. U.S. Agency for International Development, the Department of State, Department of Justice, and other agencies are all engaged in this work with their Ukrainian counterparts, as well as with Ukrainian and international NGOs, the European Union, and other donors and private sector support. A focus by foreigners on the rule of law in another country is admittedly a combination of altruism and self-interest. Our self-interest in preserving democracy in Ukraine stems from Ukraine's geopolitical importance at the center of Europe and at the eastern border of the European Union, and in our belief that a democratic Ukraine will promote stability. Our altruistic motivations stem from our fundamental belief in human rights and our desire to see people around the world enjoy the same rights that were proclaimed in our Declaration of Independence and Constitution. Many of these same rights are enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in constitutions around the world, including Ukraine. Of course, declarations and laws do not protect these rights unless those in authority actively work to uphold them and are themselves subject to them. Dr. Martin Luther King once noted that, quote, it may be true that law cannot make a man love me, but it can help him, it can keep him, from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important. Well, what is of greatest interest about this statement is not the irony that the law was in the end unable to prevent Martin Luther King's assassination, but the fact that even a civil rights leader with many, many enemies in an era of segregation could trust that the law's protections apply to him. The events of the past few months here in Ukraine have shown just how important a fair, independent, and accountable judicial system is to the further development of Ukraine's democracy. If the Ukrainian people perceive that they have unequal access to the courts, or they see selective prosecution of the political opposition, they will conclude that the system is unfair and politicized. This will erode their faith in the institutions whose primary function it is to guarantee their rights, and it will also undermine their willingness to respect the law and to act in accord with the established rules. Go back to Carruthers, he wrote, shoring up the rule of law helps temper two severe problems, corruption and crime, that are common to many transitional countries and embittering citizens clouding reform efforts. 
How are citizens to trust leaders they perceive as using the organs of power to enrich themselves at the people's expense when these same people say painful reform is necessary? How can they trust the courts and law enforcement bodies to protect their rights when they see moneyed and politically connected individuals enjoy an untouchable status with respect to the law? While rule of law cannot guarantee that there will be no corruption, it can ensure that lawbreakers will face consequences. When former Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich pressured businesses for donations or tried to sell an appointment to the Senate seat which Barack Obama had vacated when he became president, the U.S. justice system indicted and tried Blagojevich and upon his conviction, the judge sentenced him to 14 years in jail. Blagojevich is the third governor of Illinois in recent decades to have been convicted of corruption in office and sentenced to prison. Let me turn now to the rule of law and economic development, because I think this is a fundamental reality or point for Ukraine. The importance of the rule of law to economic development simply can't be overstated. If courts do not reliably and fairly settle disputes and uphold contract obligations, entrepreneurs and foreign investors will look to other markets, not wanting to see their profits stolen by rivals or corrupt officials. It's as simple as that. In the absence of reliable protection of physical property rights and intellectual property rights, Ukraine's business climate will remain weaker than its potential, and many of the best educated will seek work abroad. Potential investors here of the inconsistent application of the law for foreign businesses who lack adequate protection from corporate raiders or the timely reimbursement of bad payments. Of bad payments. It doesn't have to be this way. Ukraine boasts a well-educated and hard-working population. You have the natural and human resources and capacity to achieve the economic success of neighbors like Poland. Moses Naim, former Venezuelan Minister of Trade, World Bank official, and an editor of Foreign Policy magazine, wrote that the first phase of market reform is driven by large-scale policy decisions. The second requires building institutions and improving government's relations to business. Strengthening the rule of law is integral to the second phase. At various points over 20 years, Ukraine has, over the past 20 years, Ukraine has undertaken some of the necessary reforms required for phase one, but much work remains both in enacting further reforms and most essentially in institutionalizing and implementing those changes. To see how much foreigners perceive the need for improvement of business and investment climate here, all you have to do is look at the international ratings in which Ukraine falls below almost every other European country. Let me cite four examples. Transparency International, the Corruption Perceptions Index, ranks Ukraine number 152 out of 182 in the world. Heritage Foundation Index of Economic Freedom, Ukraine is 163 out of 183. The World Bank's Ease of Doing Business report, Ukraine is 152 out of 183. Rather than positioning Ukraine for EU integration, these numbers put Ukraine just behind Belarus, Tajikistan, and Uganda. These organizations, if you look at them over the years, see Ukraine backsliding, not making progress. 